I never thought about how much something costs. I would just take the materials that we had, that the best I could find, um, because why bother doing something if you're not going to use the best materials? It doesn't. To me, it doesn't make any sense. My head is not geared towards uh, mass, really big mass production. That 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 doesn't mean anything to me because there are a million companies that can do that. The first bag, 1970, sometime. We got a few tools from my girlfriend my wife now and I just started making stuff right away belts and wallets and next thing you know briefcases and things like that so a lot of the designs that I actually make now were done in 75 and 76 English brief uh, zip tops uh, captain's brief a lot a lot of the briefcases especially so I decided I'll see I'll do it for a year see what happens and uh, so we've just continued and it's, it's been okay. There's been, you know, good times, bad times. The industry has changed a lot of different times over the years. The mid 80s to late 80s, um, a lot of stores started going out of business. The proverbial leather shops that were all over the place and luggage stores, they all started going out of business. A lot of customers were interested in, in brand name products that were designer products. And so a lot of these stores didn't carry those products, they carried handcrafted products and in better quality products, but not brands that were fashion. And it just so, I was lucky that the owner of Kohan approached me and he asked me if I was interested in making products for them. And I figured it'd be a good supplement to what we were doing to keep us fully busy. And it ended up being really good. Um, and that lasted for about seven years. Um, and then Nike bought the company and everything changed after that. That got us through those those, that questionable period where we didn't know what we were going to do. And most of my friends, almost all of them, went out of business. Everybody I knew, just about everybody I knew in the industry was out by, by the 90s, mid-90s. You know, we started with the Internet, and the Internet has changed a lot of things, I think, for a lot of companies in this country. Um, it's allowed many, many, many different crafters to, to be able to survive because we sell to a world market. So it's a lot different than years ago when we made a catalog. It was it took six months to shoot the pictures, uh, decide what photos and print it, and then you sent it out or you had your salesman sent and give them out when they went and made the rounds. So that's a lot different than just taking a photo and putting it up on Instagram or something and 10 minutes later, the whole world can see it. There are still some suppliers, but not as many as, as years ago. And sometimes when you when you have a failure with a product, to try to get something to replace it right away might take months. And uh, same thing with the tanneries. In this country, we had so many tanneries. At one time, I'd go to a leather show and there'd be 500 tanners. And now there's half a dozen, 10 maybe. And um, a lot of the really, really good tanneries have gone. You know, they just... They didn't, they didn't continue. Well, I think that uh, a lot of them were competing against the foreign tanners, uh, especially those that were set up in China. The leather was sold for mostly shoes in this country. All the tanners knew how to make shoe leathers. Uh, some of them knew how to make handbag leathers, but everybody knew how to make shoe leather because that's where the volume was. When the Chinese were making the shoes for the American brands, it would be cheaper for them to buy the leathers in China so they wouldn't have to ship them. And they were buying a lot of the raw stock, the American raw stock. They'd ship the raw stock over and then they'd process it. And then they'd have access to the factories very quickly. So I think that hurt a lot of tanneries. And, you know, they have all the talent over there. You know, the, the Chinese are just as smart as we are. They, they know how to do everything. They have access to everything. They have access to the, the best people. They, they can go into Italy and hire one of their tanners, one of the better tanners than some of the Italian tanneries or French tanneries, and then they can produce the same products. Um, and they're integrated so that they, they make the leather, they make the bag, they make the, 
they ship them, they do everything, you know, right in one factory. So they they do that very well, and it's hurt a lot of a lot of people all over the world. But now their prices are, are coming up there, and the U.S. has has gotten more some so more competitive on some of that stuff. We have so many small companies that make really nice products, and they stand out. And the whole idea now is to continue making those kind of products and to make a living doing that, and then you'll be able to support yourself in, in, in the all the endeavors that you want to do to build that, that company up. And, you know, we, we face the same issue all the time. As soon as we get comfortable with, with a tannery or something, something happens, and then all your plans for that year got altered in minutes. So many European tanneries, they're just... It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a passion for them to make these beautiful leathers. And that's what you, you have to gravitate towards those kind of companies so they can understand what you're telling them. And we're all on the same, same page for that. And you get, you get an opportunity to see what's done, how it's done. And then that's the time to say, hey, could we try this, we try that. And then next thing you know, they have a product that you like. Because they know how to make the leathers, but they don't necessarily know how to make the leather you would like. But if you can make a tweak on, on the leather and it's not something that's really out of their, their realm, they'll do it for you. And then it usually comes out pretty nice. Uh, my head is not geared towards uh, mass, really big mass production. That, that, that doesn't mean anything to me because there are a million companies that can do that. And I just want to make, I just, I love leather. So uh, I like wood, I like leather, certain things organic that, you know, you take a piece of leather out and everyone, everyone looks at it and they say, wow, that, that's, that's really, really nice. And then when you see something like that, that's when you want to go forward with what you have. And it, it drives you to make, like, what can I make out of this? You know, you, you, and I never thought about how much something costs. I would just take the materials that we had, that the best I could find, uh, because why bother doing something if you're not going to use the best materials? It doesn't. To me, it doesn't make any sense. So I would try to buy the best materials, best hardware, best everything, and then try to come up with a really good design that does justice to this leather. Because you can make two bags. You can take one of our briefcases and make it out of an okay leather, and it looks pretty nice. And then you can take a leather that's outstanding and make the bag, and it's like, wow, it looks really nice. So no matter how good the workmanship is, the workmanship can be the same. But when the leather is right, then the whole bag is right. Because everything is the leather. And I think that's important that, especially for this country, if you want to make something in this country, you can't make something that's cheap, and you can't make something that's not. And, and now, if you sell world to the world, it's got to be world class too. It's got to be able to be out there with competing against everybody. Well, it's a nice feeling. You know, I just uh, I just never had bosses before, so it makes it awkward. But they have their ideas, and they tend to be realistic about a lot of things. It's, they're not stupid ideas. Uh, and, you know, I, I can only try to guide them, but they're going to do what they want. And sometimes there are certain things you learn only by doing them and either being successful or failures. And then you realize what you can do. But I think they have a, an edge anyway that they, they have things that they see and they can build from that. So Andrew, you know, he's done a lot of cutting, so he and I explained to him that how that's one of the things if you want to run a shop, if you do cutting and you get to feel that leather all the time, you can immediately tell when one leather is right and one leather is wrong. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't happen like in two weeks or three weeks. It takes years to learn that. But once you know that, you can talk to anybody in any tannery and you don't look like someone that can try to pull a wool over. You, you're on the same level with them. I think they're going to be all right, you know. But I, I still like to come in all the time because it's, it's like my it's been my life, you know. Yeah, yeah, sure. it, it's not like I I worked, I just come in. I I'm lucky and I only have to work half days, you know, six to six, and so that works out. That works out <laughs> fine. <laughs> yeah, for us, it's the learning everything to do right now. Yeah. yeah. And things are like constantly changing with like new technologies that we can bring in to help build the product, help help it. So it's better for the employees, um, a lot of things all the time. So it's, you know, how do you kind of find that balance 
with you know, everything um, to make everything work correctly. So, you know, you, you don't want to grow too fast where quality goes down or something happens with supplies. You never know what's going to happen. So taking those incremental steps are more important than, you know, having a two-year plan to grow this much rather than, you know, having something feasible um, that you think you can actually accomplish. And if things happen along the way, yeah, yeah. You, you know, you didn't overshoot a target and you can maybe still get very close to what you thought you could do. Like there's a good chance that when someone gets a bag, every one of us has touched that bag. You know, like we're very hands-on still with everything. Everyone has such. No, but I'm saying every one of us. Like, yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Just like about everything. Pretty yeah. much every customer that's gotten something, every one of us has done put like something into it. So and I think when the customer realizes that and understands that they appreciate what we do even more. The design of this bag came in a, a different way. Uh, shortly after we moved into our last facility, I had a gentleman that came in and he was looking for a couple of uh, log carriers. And so his only requirement was he cuts the wood 18 inches long and he wants to be able to carry the wood, you know. And this is one for me and one for my wife. So I said, okay. So I made the straps so that they went right around the bottom, but then I put the bottom on so that the straps wouldn't get the stitches damaged. This is what it was. It was the handles like this and everything. Uh, it actually had this strip across the top so that it wouldn't, wouldn't flex. And he, he, he got those two and then he decided uh, he wanted something different because his wife, the, the logs were falling off on her. She couldn't carry it the way she wanted. So I said, why don't I put a, like an end piece on, on the, you know, the, the log carrier. So when I did, I mean, this is what I saw, but without the zipper. And I said, wow, that, that looks like a, a nice duffel. I just like the way it looked. So this is actually the size that the log carrier was, this particular bag. And then to make one that was more of a standard size bag, I just shortened it four inches. And then it came up with the signature one. And, um, it, and it was, what I liked about it was you could put any weight in it because you had straps that go around the bottom. You carry logs in it, you can carry whatever you put in that bag, you should be able to carry it. And then the handles, I wanted them sewn on, no rings, no anything, so that it was all clean looking. I did the handles uh, with a slant uh, because the bag was so, like, just didn't have anything except the, the body straps. And I just liked, I just did that one day and I liked the way it looked. So then I continued with that little little slant. And since we don't put our name on the outside, I would do certain detail touches to bags so that I would know who they are and my customers would know whose bags they were. And then, for instance, the zipper pull, the, the beautiful thing about this bag is that by making the zipper extend on both sides, it opens up so easy. So you can put almost a square box in this thing where most zippers, are end to end, and even if they go along the sides, they still don't separate the same way as this does. So this you can put anything in it, carry a log in it if you want, I guess. But that's that's what I loved about it was the fact that it opened up well, and all of our customers will say, "Well, it's nice. You fold my shirt up, I just stick it right in, and I don't have to like struggle to put it in." And then you, with with this, like it is on the end, you just hold it and then you just pull it straight. So you're always pulling a straight zipper. You don't have to go around because it'll open up, say, this far, like that, and then you just put your hand in and go like that. So you're pulling a straight zipper, and where zippers wear are on, on curves. So this one, you really don't have to like struggle on the curves because you just put your finger there and pull it. And so the bag kind of designed itself. It's just that I, when I saw the side, I said, that looks like a duffel bag. You know, so that's how we, and that was um, around 1990, 91. Yeah, well the handles, um, I've always liked leather. I don't, I do, you know, like a, a pure rubber inside, which is, the, it holds its shape, yet it's not, it doesn't sag or anything, it doesn't stretch. And it's solid rubber that we use in our other ones. This one is all leather. So it's, you've got uh, four layers of leather on this side and four on this side. And the handles nest into each other when you're carrying them like this. Some people like 
this one to be on the outer side and some people like it to be on the inner side. But usually you can, you want a, a bag, whether it be a briefcase or a duffel, this width works well within your fingers like that. So it doesn't make your hands stay open. Something that's too wide, gonna keep your hands open and you can't really hold it. If, this, if it were this wide, you would never feel comfortable with this bag. But once you overlap the two, then it, it's always, you've always got a secure grip on it. And by all, all leather, there's nothing to break on it. But that's how, that's how this particular bag came about. It was a lock carrier, you know. So th this one here is, is the captain brief. And this one we, I, I did in uh, 75 or 76, 75, I think. And I was working on a, on a briefcase and I hadn't done the, I had the body. Cause this is a pretty basic shape. This gentleman came in to the shop. <clears throat> he was a police officer. He was a captain. And, and they have these pockets on their back, on their jack, on their uh, shirts. And they have a pleat in the middle and the corners are cut off like this. And he was talking to me that day. And I don't know, we just hit it off. And he was talking about, oh, if I ever had a briefcase, yeah, I like that one. And I said, you know what I could do? I said, I, I, like the, I like the shape of your pocket. And I did that. And this became like that pleat that's in the middle. And he was a captain, so I called it the captain's brief. And that's how this one went. And this has been one of our most popular bags since the beginning, you know? And that's how that one came about. I was thinking about a back, backpack that I had when I was going to grammar school. It was a, a, a military backpack and had two buckles on it. And I honestly don't remember exactly what it looked like. It probably wasn't as nice as I thought it was. But I said to myself, I want to make a briefcase that would, in my mind, be the backpack that I had, but out of leather. So I really liked this shape a lot. So I said, I think I'm going to try to put straps on this. And so I, I was doing this bag here. Uh, I, I had it all cut out had the straps cut out and then I was appointing the details to match the rest of the bag. And a gentleman came in from uh, Texas. He was an attorney and he had his, you know, the suit on with all the stitching and the alligator boots and everything. And he found me, someone in the next town mentioned my name. So he came down and he said, you know, I'm an attorney and he said, I carry two briefcases all the time. And he says, is there, I, you know, I'm from Texas, so I, I was thinking like saddlebags. And he was thinking round at first. I says, well, how are you going to put your papers in a round saddlebag? And I said, well, I had this one. I, not, I didn't have it fully assembled yet. And so I put the straps on it and I said, this kind of looks like a saddlebag, you know? And um, he liked it. He said, yeah. He says, I think that that would work. He says, but can you make two of them? One to carry in the front and the back and some kind of thing, a yoke to go over it. And uh, I did. And that was actually the first English brief that we made because I hadn't really assembled the first one I had all cut out. And it was single gussets. And so he had two briefs, single gusset. And in the back here where the yoke was, I put a, a metal rod with threaded ends and acorn caps on it. And he could take them off or he could put the, the two on and he could carry it. And this guy was big, so this thing didn't look big on him. I mean, when he had that, it came down to about here and he had one in the back and he said, I got free hands, I can carry two more bags. You know, that's, that was his thought. And that was the first one we did. And he, he was saying to me, um, like I had all the names I had for briefcases were English names at Wellington and Birmingham and all the different models. And, uh, I said, this one would work as a, a, brief, a briefcase for, you know, a Texan guy. He said, well, he says, as far as I'm concerned, that's still an English brief. And that's how the name came about. So th this is the standard, our, our lawyer's brief, which is an oversized briefcase. And the first one I had done was, um, was this size. And um, we ended up doing an even larger one, uh, there was a gentleman owned an accountant firm, so he wanted a bag that would carry all his stuff and a change of clothes, because he would go to clients and just stay like one day, go there, come back. 
whether it was car or fly. And he said, I want to just carry one bag. So we made a giant version of this that would hold all his stuff and a change of clothes, pair of shoes and everything. And then, then we never really did much with that one. We sold occasionally, but I think that's, those are the ones that we did. But then we did the smaller version than this one because we had people who liked the lawyer's look, the lawyer's brief look, but they didn't need the size. So then we make a smaller version. But this one became like the bag that would fit the 14 inch uh, perforated pads that were, in those days, the legal size was 14 inches. Now it's not, they, they changed that over the years. Uh, and so it's less now. So that's, that's those. I figure if we do the best we can all the time with whatever we have, There'll always be someone there. There's enough people out in the world to like what you want, mm -hmm. what you do, and, and you should be able to do it and grow a little bit every year. And, you know, logistically, the leathers come in, the hardware comes in, the people you're higher, and then the machinery helps us do more. That's, that's what we're trying to do.